help you today. Exodus 25, verse 10 says, And they shall make an ark out of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof. And a cubit, Deacon Fraser, show them what a cubit is. About 18 inches, okay? And a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit the half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without. Thou shalt overlay it and shall make upon it a crown of gold. Now, when it says crown, it's literally where we get the concept to crown molding. So this is what you see right here when it says crown, okay? All right. So, and thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it and put them on the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in one side of it and the two rings in the other side of it, and thou shalt make st staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, and the ark may be borne with them, carried by them, or with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. Okay? All right, you may be seated. You may be seated. I'm going to do my best to work without this podium. Can you move it for me? I want to be able to explain this. Um, and can everybody see the Ark of the Covenant from where you're sitting? Everybody? Today I want to discuss the second series, second portion of our series about the Ark of the Covenant. Um, this is very near and dear to me to explain this to the body of Christ because it speaks to so many capacities on why we do what we do in church. It is imperative for you to take notes, to uh, remember, do however you do to ingest all of this. And to recap what we talked about last week, last week we talked about the construct of the temple. You have to understand that the Ark of the Covenant originally was in this place called the Tabernacle of Moses, which was a tent that Israel set up. It was a tent that Israel set up, and you have to understand that that tent faced the east at all times. Uh, Chief Ham is interesting because I don't know if they meant to do it, but with the constructs, y'all come on, come on, come on. With the constructs of what we're doing um, and the building of this particular church building, it faces east. I don't know if they meant to do it architecturally when they built this church, but the church actually faced east. The reason why the church faces east, or excuse me, the tabernacle of Moses originally faced east is because they were cast out of the Garden of Eden westward. And the Garden of Eden was placed in the east, and so Israel's worship was always pointed to the east, hoping to reconnect with God in the fashion that they did in the Garden of Eden when man had dominion and power. Now, man had dominion in the Garden of Eden not because he was great, but because when animals looked at him, they saw the presence of God. And that's the reason why the grace of God has fallen on some of your lives. Some of the stuff that meant to destroy you couldn't destroy you because when it saw you, it didn't see you, it saw God. Okay, all right. Y'all going to make me work this morning because y'all had sleep, didn't win the raffle, so I got to help you. Lady Weiss didn't give me no basket. He got to help me. There, there, there are things that meant to destroy you, but when it saw you, it didn't see you, it saw God. Amen. Okay, there were places you were, you were at that you didn't have no business being, bullets flying through the air, and things did not connect to you because when it saw you, it didn't see you, it saw God. Amen. Sickness and disease wanted to attach itself to your body, but could not kill you because when it attached to you, it didn't attach to you, it attached to God. Okay, I got to give you some scripture before I move on and teach this. Y'all don't believe me. You think the lions in the lion's den saw Daniel? <laughs> I tell you what, you want to try something? Don't live right and go, look, go, go to the Jacksonville Zoo. It's still open. All right? And not have your life right with God. And go over there and take a picture of one of them lions and see what happens. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Waiting on the day of the general resurrection when the earth and the sea, we will commit your body to the ground. But if God, if your enemies have cast you in a place and God's hand is on you, 
what they meant to do to destroy you can't destroy you. All right? So it is the presence of God, it is the grace of God that keeps all of us. And that's what Israel wanted to reconnect with. And that's the reason why God ordered them when they pitched the tent, the tabernacle of Moses, to face it towards the east. It was symbolic to reconnecting to God. They came into the tabernacle, and this is why Psalms 100 says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Now, it meant you should, have a, you should be thankful at the fact that you get to come in the house of God. Amen. All right, let's help the saints this morning. Brother James White, I'm going to try my best to help him. If you look back over your life, you will realize you really didn't deserve to wake up. So we enter into his gates with thanksgiving. I come to church with the mindset of thankfulness because I don't even deserve to be here. I don't, I, I look, I don't come here to judge other people. Look at what you got on, how you're acting. I'm worried about me because when I look back over my life and I think things over, I am thankful at the fact that God has let me see another day. All right, y'all want to sit here and act deep. I'm going to keep going. Places I ain't have no business being, things I didn't have no business doing, stuff I didn't have no business saying. God kept me through all of that stuff. Because the prerequisite to my relationship with God is understanding that it has nothing to do with my goodness, but everything to do with his. Religion makes you think you've got to do everything right. You can't do everything right. God never called you to be perfect. He called you to be obedient. And some of y'all are driving yourself crazy trying to be perfect. And every time you cough, you think God done gave you COVID for doing something stupid. Amen. Lord, I done got it. Jesus. I'm in your business, aren't I? Because it's the psychological construct of every human being. What you're thinking, I think. What you battle, I battle. What you go through, we go through as well. So he says to Israel, enter into my gates with thanksgiving and to my courts with praise. There is a shift, Landell. Land got my back the whole time, by the way. Land been riding me for a long time. So, so here it is. There is a shift from thanksgiving to praise. Because thanksgiving... Mother Fraser, is when I realize what he's done for me. See, some of y'all ought to be shouting because of what he's done for me. But the shift to praise happens when I realize who he is. A lot of people can't effect, uh, uh, effectually praise God properly because we really don't realize who he is and what he's done. So when they come into the tabernacle with Thanksgiving, they shift the praise later weeks because, check this out, the first thing they see, as we talked about last week, is a brazen altar. So the brazen altar is when the priest, uh, uh, I used pot last week, she don't want me to use a knife, she don't, she don't want me to use a knife. Yeah. So, so pot comes in to me as the priest, she brings an animal with her. We lay hands on the animal, she confesses all of her sins. And then I slit the animal's throat and fill up this little bowl with blood. And then we set the animal on fire. Her praise, Sister Grant, it shifts from thanksgiving to praise. Why? Because she realizes that she's no longer guilty for her sins. Oh, man, y'all, y'all all right. Stay sleepy. I got you. Push the app a little bit. They, they might be cold. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> Listen, she realizes... She goes from thanksgiving, oh, I'm so thankful to be here, to shouting all over the place that she's not dead because she realizes her sins are not hers anymore. Her sins now have been transferred. All right. Okay. I'm trying to help them later weeks. So every day that I come into the temple, it reminds me, it reminds me that my sins have been shifted from me to Jesus. And so now, Joe, I don't walk in guilt. It's not, that I don't, it's not that I'm arrogant. You can't hold me to the mess that I made because if God has forgiven me, I ain't even worrying about you no more. All right. 
Okay, some of you can't move forward because every time somebody see you, they remind you of what you did to make them upset. And my whole thing to you is if God has gotten over it, you need to pray and get over it too because I'm moving on with my life and I'm not going to be held in bondage by your emotions. Some of y'all can't move forward because you got people in your life. Girl, remember this? Girl, remember this? This is why God changed names on people. And he's changed your name too. I've seen marriages dissolve because people can't forgive one another. But expect forgiveness from Christ. I ain't telling you to take everything from everybody. I'm telling you not to carry hatred in your heart. Because there's some stuff you can't get from God like that. So they're, they're, they're immediately shifting from thanksgiving to praise because my sins aren't mine anymore. I came to free five people before I move on and I recap going to the Ark of the Covenant. Your sins don't even belong to you. Because the moment you feel guilty, you're telling Christ, I don't believe that when you died, you took my sin. See, when you get that thing down in your spirit, you will have a real good shout. It, it doesn't mean that you get to sin and do whatever you want. It just simply means that when I slip in this walk called life, that it's not mine. It's his. And so they go from the brazen altar with praise. And so what happens is they get left at the brazen altar. Now, the brazen altar was a stinky place because what happened was it smelled like dead carcass. It smelled like dead animals. And they stopped their mother weeks at the brazen altar and they praised God while the priest handled his business. Isn't it something, Dr. Weeks, that we can get a church of people that just praise God for what he's done and allow us to handle our business? Notice now, they're praising God in a place that is uncomfortable. The ambiance is not wonderful. It smells bad. And some people can't come to church and praise God like they should because they have a conditional praise. They stayed at the brazen altar and worship in a place that was uncomfortable. And you have to understand that sometimes worship and praise is uncomfortable. Sometimes you got to learn how to praise God when bills are due. You got to learn how to praise God when people are acting up. You got to learn how to praise God when people have walked out on you. You ain't never praised until you've watched everybody walk out and you still got a shout on your lip. You got to learn. When bills are due and you got children to feed and everything and nobody asks you, are you okay? Because you look like you're blessed. There's an African proverb that says, nobody asks the lion, is he okay? So you got to learn. I'm finna get old Baptist on him, ham. You got to learn how to take your book, line your own hymn. Read your own scripture, sing your own song, pray your own prayer, preach your own sermon, sing your own song, dance your own dance. You got to learn how to do these things. Stop needing people. Stop needing people when it come to you and God. You got to learn how to turn your car into a sanctuary. I'm driving to work praising God. May not be perfect, but I'm praising Him. Because He is God and besides Him. Y'all, please don't push me. I, I, this is the introduction. I got Golly, I turned my, I turned my ho hospital bed into a, into a sanctuary one time. Laying in the hospital bed, and, and they hadn't, when I first got there, because you know, I don't stay in double rooms in the hospital. But they put me in a double room. I said, Lord, when you heal me, heal him too. There are some people, Jesus, that's getting healed because they're beside. You, you, you got to understand that as you get better, there are some people that's getting healed because they're in the vicinity of you. You think you went to prison because you did wrong? Everybody done done wrong. No, God healed everybody in the jail because you were there. You have to understand. When you learn how to worship him in spirit and in truth. Y'all yeah. yeah. sit down. I'm just talking. 
Well, sit down. I, I've learned how to do things. Learn how to do things. So they learn how to praise him at the brazen altar in an uncomfortable place. But the priest's job, your job, was just moving forward. You see, the priest had to go from the brazen altar to what we call the lavern. And he had to wash himself. He had to wash himself. The lavern. You see it up there? That's not a cup that a pimp holds. <laughs> Some of y'all been watching American Pimp and started thinking about when Don Magic Wand was at the Players Ball. And that is not, it's actually this huge basin that was made from the contributions of women. A lot of people have an issue with me because I've ordained women in the church. But we've overlooked for years the contributions of women in the church. We overlook that because if you take the etymology of certain scriptures and you go to the book of Matthew, when Jesus came out of the grave, there was a woman standing there. He said, go tell my disciple. If you study her relationship, she was a former harlot. Okay. She was a lady of the night. <laughs> Me and you are right. <laughs> but she was the first person to see Jesus when he came out of a grave. And he sent her on a mission to go tell his disciples who had become apostles that he has risen. The contributions of women are remarkably, remarkably important. And here it is. They took their jewelry and they gave it to the blacksmiths. And the blacksmiths made the lavern, the lavern for the priest to wash in. If I ask y'all for y'all jewelry right now, we won't have now. And so the priest washed himself. May I borrow you? So remember I said that I had to slit the throat of a bull and fill up a bowl with blood. And I would take this bowl of blood and hand it to the, 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 the temple assistant. That's where the, the armor barrel ministry came from. So you stand right here. And then I would go mm -hmm, and wash into the lavern and walk, wash in the lavern and put on all white and walk into this place called the holy place. The holy place. Now, in the holy place, there's, there's a tent. There is a, it is a two-room tent. It is the holy place first. In that place was the menorah. The menorah was, that's what it looked like when he walked in. To the left, to the left is a candlestick called the menorah. It provided the only light in the holy place. It provided the only light in the holy place. Okay? I would take this bowl of blood from Deacon Fraser. You can go sit right down. And I'd walk into the holy place, and I would light the menorah. It provided light. And then I would go over to the table of showbread. Now, the table of showbread was this gold table that had 12 loaves of unleavened bread. And it had wine. The unleavened bread signified that when Israel moved from Egypt. God had moved in such a place where he killed the firstborn of all of Egypt. And everybody who did not have blood on their doorposts, he took them out. And he told Israel, make haste, get ready quickly the next day. So they were cooking food for the journey and they could not put yeast in it. And so that's the reason why it did not rise. It was unleavened bread. And God told the priest, put 12 of them on, on the table of showbread to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. The holy place was the place that the man of God visited every day. He visited every day. The table of showbread was unleavened, and he changed out the bread every day. He ate some of it. He ate some of it. A lot of times that was the first meal of the day that the priest ate was a little bit of wine and some showbread. I said, Lord, why? Did you have him put that unleavened bread there? Have you ever had unleavened bread before? It ain't jiffy. It ain't jiffy. 
Unleavened bread does not taste well at all. I said, Lord, why did you have him eat that every day? He said, because I had to remind him of where I brought him from. And there are some things in your life that God will not take from you to remind you of how far he's brought. So we have to praise God every once in a while for the things he didn't take. Okay? Now I'm finna connect two thoughts. Remember I said don't let nobody make you feel bad about your past. But sometimes God will leave something in your, in your present that reminds you of your past, not to make you feel guilty, but to show you how far he's brought you. Okay? Okay? So there's some things in your life he'll leave in place just to show you some stuff. Just to show you, hey, don't get the big head. I brought you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Do you hear me? Not to feel guilty, but to give me praise. So he's in the Holy of Holies. He would eat this, and then he would go to the altar of incense. The altar of incense is where the man of God prayed at every single day on behalf of himself, his family, and the entire nation of Israel. This is the holy place. The holy place was a place of preparation for the priest in order to get into the presence of God and to hear from God. Listen to me carefully, those of you who sing praise and worship. This is the etymology of the ministry of praise and worship. Or in the Baptist church, before praise and worship was ever started, it was called devotion. We sung hymns like, Guide me, O thy great Jehovah. The, pre, the, the deacon would line to him and the people of God would sing in response. It's called call and response. It actually finds its etymology before that in a phrase called Gregorian chant. Okay? There's a reason why we do these things. And so the holy place was a place of preparation. And so praise and worship is not a concert. Praise and worship is not about getting up here showing off my, off my outfit and I can barely sing. <coughs> I'm, finna, I'm finna go there. I'm sorry. I see praise team not look like in vogue. Y'all remember in vogue? And you up here styling and profiling instead of giving God glory for who he is and what he does because your ministry, like the holy place, was to prepare to come into the presence of God. It was not about looking good. It was about being prepared. And a lot of people don't expect, you come to church and it's a whole move of God and you sit there and I ain't getting nothing out of service. You wouldn't prepare. They in there running and hollering and falling out. They wouldn't prepare. You wouldn't prepare. And just because um, you're my talking point, somebody hollering don't mean they're getting anything. I'm old. I'm, I'm, I'm old. I'm from Lake, but don't let the word, the big words fool you. I'm going to use words like hollering. You're doing all of that and don't live right. You're doing all of that and not delivered. You're doing all of that and not blessed because you want people to watch you instead of you worshiping God. So the holy place was meant to prepare the priest to come before the presence of God. He did this every day. Heard somebody mess, right? Killed a bull. Went here, did it every day, right? Because preachers have to be people, like I said last week, that don't gossip. I got to be able to hear what you got to say, and you not worry about them hearing it. And some of you have been church hurt because your pastors enjoy laughing and giggling too much. Come to these ministers and everything like that in private and in confidence. Girl, you heard about so-and-so. Ah, girl, you right out of here. He did this every day. But once a year, once a year, he had to hear the sins of Israel. Once a year, he had to do a sacrifice for all of Israel. So what would happen is he would take two goats, Right? And he would wrap a red ribbon around both goats. Am I boring y'all? Y'all still with me? 
Chief Ham, he would take two white goats and he would wrap red ribbons around the heads of both of them. One of them, he would say, this is, we now transfer all of my sins, the sins of my family, and the sins of all of Israel. It's called the Day of Atonement. And he would lay that goat on the altar, slit his throat, fill up the bottle, the basin with blood, set him on fire. And then for the other one, he would say, this is for the curses of Israel, the sins of omission, and he would let him go into the wilderness. And so he would walk about 200 yards, and he would give him to you. And you would walk this goat 200 yards, and you would give it to another person. And you would walk that goat 200 yards, and you give him to another person. Until the goat was so far away from the camp, he carried the sins of Israel away from the camp. Not just in death, but away from the camp. That goat is where we get the term scapegoat from. What carry sin. And if that goat was to journey back to Israel, the people of God would throw rocks at it to keep it away from them. Some of y'all need to throw rocks at what comes back in your life. Some of y'all need to get you a good old rock and stand there and say, "Uh uh-uh, nah, you ain't coming back in here. God delivered me from you. Okay, all right. I'm trying to help them. I'm talking about church being good and then all of a sudden somebody inboxed you. Church being great, now all of a sudden somebody who gave up on you, didn't like you, now all of a sudden you successful. Baby, how you doing? You better throw a rock. So on the Day of Atonement, he did all of these different things. On the Day of Atonement, he did all of these different things. And then he filled up this bowl with blood, walked into, prepared himself at the laver and changed clothes, and then his attendant would give him this bowl of blood, and he walked into the holy place, lit the menorah, ate from the table of showbread, offered up prayers on behalf of Israel, and then God would let him behind the veil. It is this once a year in which, (coughs) excuse me, this once a year, that the priest was in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, he goes from the Holy of Holies, I mean, excuse me, from the Holy Place to this area that is called the Holy of Holies. Now, you have access to this like we talked about last week because when Jesus died, he made all of those steps for you. He took your sins at the altar. He washed you. And then he split the veil so you can walk from the holy place to the holy of holies. Am I making sense? Clap if you believe God did it. Now, now, so now we're at the Ark of the Covenant. Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 through 15, tells us where God tells Moses how to construct the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I want to help you the way I helped Bible study the other night. I need you to write this down if you don't catch anything else. The Ark of the Covenant is a piece of furniture that is not God. It represents the presence of God. When we take communion with Welch's grape juice and them little stale cracker things, y'all ain't going to talk in here. Y'all, I'm telling you. And I'm so glad we take bread before we take wine, and that thing is stuck right there. <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about. You young people, hey, y'all, I'm telling you. Them little stale wafers, y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all remember that? And they take, you take it, stick it on your tongue. <laughs> y'all all right? That is a representation of the body and blood of Jesus. It is not the body and blood of Christ. Now, because we are a, the Catholic Church actually believed that they do it, that's why they are Eucharistic. We're not Eucharistic, we believe in replicas. If I came in here one day and had some real blood poured up, y'all would leave here in a heartbeat. Now, half of y'all probably wish the wine was real. I love this church. (laughs) 
I thank God for the apostle. <laughs> you do offering them, they'll give all their money, they drunk. <laughs> right? It is a replica. The Ark of the Covenant is a replica. It represents, excuse me, the presence of God. It is the honor that the people of God had for it that God blessed. Because if it was God, if this piece of furniture or the piece of furniture in your text was God, then we would be guilty of idolatry. We would be guilty of worshiping an object and not the supreme and sovereign God. So it is not God. Say it with me. It is not God. All right. But when we honor it, we're saying, God, we honor what your word has said. All right. We need to start taking notes. So Exodus chapter 25 Verses 10 through 15 tells us how to construct it. Moses told the carpenters of Israel, take a, take shittim wood, shittim wood from an, from an acacia tree and make this whole box. Now you have to understand that this was specific wood that was outside of the promised land that Israel was given by God. The construct of the ark reminded them of how far he had brought them. But also, this particular wood was the same kind of wood, was was from the same kind of tree that God spoke to Moses from when it was a burning bush. So God tells them, make this out of that. Now, they couldn't make it out of oak, maple, What's the kind of furniture you like, baby? Cherry wood, pine. Couldn't make it out of any of that. You had to make it out of what he told you to because God is a God, check this out, of specifics. A lot of you aren't blessed because you don't understand the concept that I was teaching earlier when I said God doesn't want you perfect. He wants you to be obedient. And some of you follow God up to a certain point. And you can't get the fullness of his blessings following him to a certain point. Do you know God will tell you, go talk to this person on this day and wear this? Go talk to this person on this day at this address for this job and wear this. And some of you will go there on a different day, wearing a different shirt, at a different time. I don't know why the Holy Ghost told me that. So you have to follow God to the letter. If God tells you to show up on Thursday at the bank at 1230 wearing this, you better know it's already somebody he's shown in a vision what you have on. He's already prepared somebody to bless you in the capacity of your obedience. But if you don't walk in it, you can't receive it. So he tells Israel, build this Art out of a specific thing. And then overlay it with gold. Everything in the temple, everything with the ark, points to Jesus. The wood represents his humanity, but the gold represents his divinity. Some of y'all been reading your Bible wrong. You think that Jesus showed up in the book of Matthew. When Jesus was there all the time, why do you think God said in the beginning of time, let us create man in our image? Anytime you read, I'm going to help y'all real quickly because y'all, do y'all read your Bibles? How many of y'all got a Bible you just look on your phone? Preachers over there, I do both. <laughs> Throw some over there at y'all. I wish I ain't asked y'all to be on both sides. <laughs> both. <laughs> it's good for you to get a Bible, and I'm gonna tell you why. Because phones will distract you. You'll be trying to read the word of God and get a notification on Facebook. Am I helping five people? Get you a Bible, step away from your phone, and read the Word of God 
giving God that moment, even if it's only for five minutes. The reason why I told you that is because when you look in the Old Testament, Jesus is all through the Old Testament, and one of the, ind- one of the indications of his presence in the Old Testament is anytime you see the phrase, the angel of the Lord, Jesus himself operates angelically in the Old Testament. So whenever you see the phrase, the angel of the Lord, it is an early manifestation or theophany of Jesus. Jesus is all through the text, and so this particular box was created prophesying to us the coming of Christ. All right? In physical form to die for our sins. So we're going to make it a wood representing the fact he'll be man like you and I, but gold to represent his divinity. Okay? It had staves made of the same wood, rings that carried it properly, because the priests were to carry this a specific way. And this is when you realize that when the people of God came to Israel for the first time, brought the Ark of the Covenant for the first time in decades, because it was in the camp of their enemies, because they carried it on a cart, the cart shook, a man touched it, and he died. He died because the people who were supposed to carry it did not carry it properly. And as I've said before, when preachers don't carry the word the right way, people die. They may not die physically, but they'll die in spiritual places because you're playing games instead of preaching the truth. Stop trying to be popular. Stop trying to be popular. So you carried it a certain way. They constructed it with a crown, a crown molding for it, for it to have beauty to it. And then at the top of it, the top, or as what we would call the lid, is actually called the mercy seat. This is called the mercy seat. Amen. And as they constructed the mercy seat, the mercy seat had a, a, a symbolic function, a function. The first thing was, at the priest, once a year during the time of atonement, this bowl of blood that you gave me, teach a class on man. So the man of God will bring this bowl of blood with him. And his first order of business is he would take his finger, stick it in the bowl of blood, and he would touch the mercy seat seven times to Three, four, five, six, seven. He did that, Melvina, because outside of, of, the, of the holy place, they sacrificed an animal for the sins of Israel. For the sins of Israel. But he had to come to God with blood and put it on the mercy seat seven times for generational curses. In other words, when God accepted this blood, he was saying, just because your mama did it, don't mean it's going to happen to you. Because in those days, when you sinned, you might have got away with it, but it affected your child if you didn't ask for forgiveness properly. This is why during the days of Jesus, when that boy was born blind, they came to Jesus and they said, who sinned, this boy or his mother? Because based on the Mosaic law, when you sinned, sin transferred to your child. Some of you think you're going to be a drunk because your uncle was a drunk or your daddy was a drunk. You think you're going to be a drug addict because your mama was a drug addict. You don't have to be. You don't have to be. You want to know why? Because I don't kill a blood, I don't kill a bull once a year and come in here and do this. But when Jesus died, from the time he was struck at the high priest's house to the time they pierced him in the side, he shed his blood seven times. This is why you ought to praise him. Because Jesus didn't just die for your sins, he died for generational curses. You need to quit listening to the doctor when they say it runs in your family. It ain't got to run in your family. 
You have to make the decision. My cousin Vernon, his name is Clifford. That's Vernon. He and I talk a lot. He's here doing different things for me. It's stuff he tells me that I didn't know because I'm younger than he is. I never knew my dad's mother. Vernon tells me she was one of the best cooks this side of heaven. One day she was hanging up clothes in her back room, right? And died of a massive heart attack. Died of a massive heart attack. That was my dad's mom. My dad's grandfather died of a massive heart attack at a doctor's appointment. Hence why I went to a doctor's appointment. He went back in the back. The doctor came back a couple minutes later and said, Miss Weeks, I don't know what to tell you. Miss Weeks is dead. A couple years ago, one of our first cousins was in the car with her husband, collapsed over, died of a massive heart attack. A couple years, five, six years ago, no, no, 10, 15 years ago, one of our uncles pulled up to his face at work, had a massive heart attack in his car and died. There is one, two, three, four generations of massive heart attacks in my family. So when I went into the hospital with a minor heart condition, I made a decision that my son won't face this. Because God, I accept the fact that you died for my sins, but I believe you died for generational curses as well. And just because, you know what? Just because it attacked my lineage doesn't mean that it has to take me out too. Somebody has to make a decision and say, it stops here. Okay, I don't care if everybody in your family was poor, you have to make the decision that I'm going to be the first millionaire. I'm going to break the generational curse of lack and poverty in my life. It runs in your family. Well, it's finna run out. Well, you know it runs in your family. Yeah, until it ran into me. Because Goliath challenged everybody in Israel until he ran up against David. So when you understand this, you understand that just accepting salvation is good, but there's a deeper level of God. He gets struck at the high priest's house, right? They place a crown of, a crown of thorns on his head. Blood pierced him in one hand, pierced him in the other hand, pierced him in one foot, pierced him in another foot, and pierced him in his side. Seven times he sheds blood to alleviate all of your curses. Just because it happened to them does not mean it's going to happen to you. And if your mother abused you, you don't abuse your child. You have to be the person who makes the decision that this breaks in my lineage. He takes blood and he sprinkles it on the mercy seat seven times, representing the alleviation of generational curses. He does it in between two angels that are called cherubims. These angels have their head bowed and their wings pointing inward, symbolizing worship. Because worship is just not a position. Worship is a posture. Some of y'all think worship is the slow song and praise is the fast song. Worship is a position it is, and a posture. In Israel, there were only, really, three positions of posture. Kneeling, standing, and laying flat on your face. So why is it when the spirit high, you still sitting down? The 
The angels were in this position of worship on their knees, and the angels that are representing here are cherubims. Cherubims guarded the gate of Eden when God cast man out of Eden. But if you look at them and you study Hebraic angelology or angelic behavior, you realize that in the rank and file, now in Christianity we rank them high, but we're talking about this from a Judaistic standpoint. These cherubims rank at the bottom of the hierarchy. They ain't way up here. They way down here. This morning I'm standing in the kitchen and I'm asking God, I said, why did you do that? He said, because I want to show people that you ain't got to have a big title to worship me. You don't have to have a big title in church. You don't have to have a big position to worship me. In fact, some of the people with big titles don't worship me like they should. You the archbishop of this, your title bigger than your church. And you're more concerned with people honoring you than you are honoring God. These cherubims stayed here symbolizing the worship that God was owed. And if God was happy with the sacrifice that happened out there, the preparation that happened from the laverne to the holy place, and he was pleased with the priest in the Holy of Holies, Jock, he did not kill him. See, the whole time he's doing this on the Day of Atonement, they got a rope tied around his waist. And if his heart is not right with God, God would kill him. And the people would drag him out of the temple. I told you this before, on his garments he had pomegranates and bells. But when the Holy Spirit dropped on him and visited him, it would make him move and shake and dance. And the people outside would rejoice because they knew God was pleased with the priests. Have you ever been sitting in church and watched God fall on somebody and it make you feel good? Y'all yeah. need to learn how to shout because of what God is doing in somebody else's life. Right. You, you, you quit being jealous when somebody else get blessed with a new car and praise God because somebody else got what they've been praying for. We're not in competition. We're in encouragement. We got old ladies mad at young ladies because they getting married. We got educated people with degrees getting mad, mad at people who didn't go to school because they got more money than you. Why don't you just be happy for people? The mercy seat, if everything pleased God, the priest did not die. I praise him. Because don't you know, it's some people that start coughing and three weeks later they were dead. And you start coughing and still here. You, okay, all right. Play crazy with it if you want to. What took other people out did not take you out. You are still here. And for that, you ought to give God glory. You ought to give him some kind of praise. Here is the good shout. Ready? That's the, that's, the, that's the holy place shout. Hey, go to holy of holy place. While you were sick, the devil told you you were going to die. Amen. And he is a liar. You ought to praise God because God made the devil a liar. If, if, if God was pleased, he showed up as a vapor of smoke into this place. Angels bowed before him. Blood was acknowledged by him. And his smoke filled the temple. And the priests fell in worship. And he would come back to the people of God with a fresh word from the Lord. How do you know if your pastor has been with God? The word is fresh. 